So due to the large number of Civil War tie-ins between the main issues of the Civil War story arc, we're going to begin the process of splitting these videos up. And so what we're going to do is in this portion of the discussion, we're going to focus on the events leading up to Civil War Frontline issue number two. And then we'll follow that pattern accordingly, where we'll talk about the next set of tie-ins after Civil War Frontline issue number two, until we've completed all of the tie-ins between Civil War issues number two and number three. So as we continue our discussions regarding the tie-ins between Civil War issue number two and issue number three, we actually have to jump back to before Civil War issue number two and talk about Civil War Frontline issue number one. Now the Civil War Frontline comics are very, very important and the reason why is because these 11 limited issue comics really are going to give us the down, gritty, dirty part of what's going on with Civil War. Where the main Civil War storyline itself will focus on the idea of superheroes battling each other and really will kind of lead to this grandiose conflict and these solo tie-ins as, as far as Wolverine and She-Hulk and other individuals go focus on those people, the frontline comics give us perspective on the guys that just really wouldn't get a lot of notoriety. The down-home, backyard, street-level kind of heroes. The ones that aren't big, they aren't, they aren't well-known known, they're not part of major teams, and really gives us an idea of just how deep this rift goes between the superheroes and their stance over the Superhuman Registration Act. So Civil War Frontline issue number one introduces us to two characters. The first person is Sally Floyd. And the second person is Ben Urich. Now, these two individuals, as they progress through the Frontline series, will really kind of begin to represent two camps. The first is pro-registration, and the second is anti-registration. Ben Urich, for the most part, is pro-registration, and we actually see that in his early kind of speech as he's conversing with Sally Floyd, although it's not until later on that he will really kind of be pulled into being part of the pro-registration movement by Iron Man. Sally Floyd is really kind of interviewing Spider-Man as we progress through the story and what we see is Spider-Man really kind of revealing his most his deepest concern with regards to the Superhuman Registration Act and the way that he does it he is really also kind of voicing the concerns of most everybody else who is against registration now as we know with Civil War issue number two Spider-Man reveals himself simply because he really kind of feels honor bound to ally himself with Iron Man but as he is conversing with Sally Floyd he tells her that these people who are superheroes are not just kind of running around and partying and doing whatever and just kind of having a good time that they have just as much to lose as anybody else that their mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and that supervillains and other individuals normal humans who would seek to do them harm will have a greater way to do that will have an easier way to target them if they know what their real identities are and this particularly hits home for spider-man because throughout the publication history of the spider-man comics Peter Parker was really kind of always able to maintain this invisible wall between individuals that would seek to do them harm and people that know his actual identity. It was a way for him to keep people like Mary Jane Watson and Aunt May safe, especially after the death of Gwen Stacy story arc where she was killed by the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn. And so for him, when he's talking with Sally Floyd, he says his biggest concern is that people who didn't previously know his real identity will now know what it is and they'll be able to target those that he loves a lot easier and really kind of target them in a way to where their goal is to directly uh, either I guess maybe cut Spider-Man out of the scene entirely or to rent him virtually incapable to the point that he doesn't want to be Spider-Man anymore because of the emotional, emotional turmoil. Now from this point we cut to uh, the reveal of Tony Stark uh, letting people know that he is Iron Man. Now this isn't necessarily a huge scene in the sense that he is revealing himself to be Iron Man. This has been done before but it's really kind of a big scene because one of the biggest parts of Tony Stark's character in Marvel Comics is that he's an alcoholic and it's not something that he makes known to everybody. It's really only something that us as the reader and a handful of other individuals know. But this is really kind of him coming out and really kind of bearing it all and kind of setting this, this example that if he is going to side as a superhero with the idea that superheroes should register himself or register themselves and he is going to kind of lead this forefront, then he should be the first one to take the first step, which he does. In addition, the fact that he is now coming out and telling people that he is an alcoholic 
means that there are going to be personal ramifications in his own uh, personal life that are going to be a result of this. But for him, it's more of doing what he perceives to be the right thing than doing what may be uncomfortable or maybe something that he thinks will be uh, personally painful for him. Now, after this, we actually get a reveal that's pretty big, and this is very important as we progress through the Civil War story. What we learn is that Speedball, one of the members of the New Warriors who had, in, had encountered Nitro and had really kind of forced Nitro into the situation where he's self-destructed, is actually alive. And he is taken to a hospital, and as he comes to, we learn that he's under arrest. The individual that is presiding over him is part of the S.H.I.E.L.D. anti-superhuman registration terrorist movement, meaning that he is part of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the NSA and is there to ensure that individuals who do not register are placed under arrest. And he tells Speedball four things. The first thing he tells him is that uh, he is the only survivor of the incident in Stamford, Connecticut. The second thing he tells him is that the casualties ranged anywhere between 600 and 1,000, and at least 60 of the people who were killed were children. The third thing that he tells him is that because of the fact that he had absorbed the brunt of impact from Nitro's explosion, and that the brunt of the impact with regards to his kinetic energy absorbing powers had kind of conflicted with the uh, synapses in his brain, he is now virtually powerless. He is unable to use his abilities to do anything at all because his abilities, uh, abilities do not exist. The fourth thing that he tells him is that he's under arrest. And this really kind of brings an end to the Civil War Frontline uh, issue number one comic. So Thunderbolts issue number 103 brings Baron Helmu Zemo and the Thunderbolts into the fold regarding the Civil War event. Now the way that the Thunderbolts were, were originally founded is really kind of interesting. The Thunderbolts were formed as a new version of the Masters of Evil under Baron Helmu Zemo, the son of Baron Heimrich Zemo, who was Captain America's enemy during World War II. And the whole basis of this new formation of the Masters of Evil was to infiltrate the Avengers, masquerading as a group called the Thunderbolts, and destroy the Avengers from within. However, the longer that these uh, villains played the role of superheroes, the more they began to enjoy the role of superheroes. And so after a conflict that really kind of resulted in Baron Helmu Zemo uh, almost sacrificing his life for Captain America, we really kind of see them uh, becoming a superhero group looking for redemption. Now, as we the story progresses, as the story kind of unfolds regarding uh, Thunderbolts issue number 103, we see that the Thunderbolts are recruited by Tony Stark, Ant-Man, Reed Richards, and Peter Gyrick in order to uh, play the role of tracking down supervillains who refuse to register and recruiting them to the cause of the pro-registration movement. Now, this is when we really kind of see Tony Stark getting into less than savory methods of promoting the superhuman registration movement. And this is when we really kind of see him ally himself with people who are dubious at best, because we don't really know what the intentions are as far as Baron Helmu Zemo goes in this, this part of the comic. We don't really know what it is that he wants to do. We don't know if he is truly just masquerading as a good guy, and is at heart a bad guy, or if he really is looking for redemption. And this kind of dubious nature of him as a person is, of course, mentioned and discussed with uh, um, Reed Richards and Ant-Man and Tony Stark directly with Baron Helmu Zemo because of the shady history that both of those groups have in the past, they're not really sure whether they can trust him or not, but at this point, it's really the best option that they have. Now, as the story progresses, we see that the first assignment that uh, Baron Helmu Zemo gets is to track down various supervillains. He's successful in doing that, but as the comic comes to a close, we actually learn what his intentions are, and that while the Thunderbolts issue number 103 comic took place, or begins to take place, two weeks after the events of Stamford, Connecticut, three weeks or a week before the events of Stamford, Connecticut, the Thunderbolts had already begun rounding up various uh, superheroes and supervillains in the Marvel community and were really kind of indoctrinating them to their own cause so that Baron Helmu Zemo could build up an army for his own purposes. So, Amazing Spider-Man issue number 533 is a very interesting comic because this comic book follows the aftermath of Peter Parker revealing his identity publicly. And as we'll see, the fallout of this really kind of compounds on itself time and time again, and things really kind of go from bad to worse regarding the life of Peter Parker. The first reaction that Peter Parker has to revealing his public identity uh, is that he's physically sick. 
he really actually starts vomiting in one of the restrooms. And then he confronts Tony Stark and tells Tony Stark that should anything happen to him, that he is to take care, that Tony Stark is to take care of Mary Jane Watson and Aunt May. But if anything happens to Mary Jane Watson and Aunt May, that Peter Parker, Spider-Man, will directly come after Tony Stark. From there, we see that when Peter Parker arrives home, that his home is totally flooded with the press. Everybody really wants to ask him questions. And we're really kind of given questions of our own as the reader. You know, we see that this kind of uh, maybe compilation, so to speak, on the pages begins to unfold where we see individuals like Eddie Brock uh, come to the realization that he, that Peter Parker is Spider-Man when he reveals his identity. We see that Rhino and various other individuals uh, see that he reveals his identity as Peter Parker. In addition, we're also left to ask the question, what's going to happen regarding both superheroes and supervillains? The supervillains of Spider-Man now know his personal identity. They know who he is and they know exactly how to attack him in a way that will make him the most vulnerable and could possibly render him uh, totally out of the scene as far as being Spider-Man. But we also kind of have to ask the question that if Spider-Man is one of the most prominent superheroes in the world and has kept his personal identity so close to himself, so well, so well guarded, what are these superheroes going to do? Are they going to look at him as kind of the standard? Are they going to follow his lead? Or are they going to entrench themselves further underground after seeing the aftermath of Peter Parker coming out publicly? In addition, once he's at home and he's with Aunt May and Mary Jane, we see that Tony Stark is speaking publicly and addressing the issue of what they're going to do to round up various superpowered beings because S.H.I.E.L.D. can't do it by themselves. And he states that a new team is being formed to round up those superpowered individuals who refuse to register themselves and that Peter Parker's Spider-Man is going to be one of them. Now, this really takes Peter Parker by surprise because he did not sign up for this. He wasn't even made aware that this is something that Tony Stark intended to do. So he and Mary Jane leave to confront Tony Stark, but they take the back alley because the front of the apartment is covered with the press. As they leave into the back alley, they realize that the back alley is covered with press, and a fan of uh, Captain America makes an attempt on Peter Parker and Mary Jane's life. Peter Parker is successful in stopping it, and this individual is apprehended, and Peter Parker goes to meet Tony Stark uh, dressed in his Spider-Man outfit. He confronts Tony Stark and says that he did not sign up for this, this is not something that he agreed with, and he thoroughly disliked uh, Iron Man signing him up for something that he didn't know about. He tells uh, Tony Stark that should anything like this ever happen again, that he has to be informed, so that he can make sure that preparations are made for his loved ones in case another attempt is made on their life. From there, the comic book comes to an end as we see this team that Tony Stark has formed, which consists of some of the most prominent superheroes in the Marvel Universe, with the exception of Captain America and his side of things. And this is really kind of important here, because this is where we see the line officially being drawn. This is really where Marvel gives it to us that there are now two main camps of superheroes. If ever there were anything to tell us who's on what side, this is it. You have virtually all these individuals who are now on Tony Stark's side. Now, the numbers will bolster and they will grow as we progress throughout the Civil War storyline, but we are also kind of left to see that the most prominent members, the Fantastic Four, the Thunderbolts, uh, Ant-Man, Hank Pym, uh, the Wasp, that all these individuals are now on the side of Tony Stark. And then we will ultimately switch to the position of Captain America, and we will see the entire side of things from Captain America's perspective. So Civil War Frontline issue number two follows some major events as they unfold in the Civil War storyline. And we actually see some great storytelling in this comic. I would go as far as to say that this is probably some of the best storytelling in the entire Civil War event. The comic opens up with Ben Urich revealing that he knew who Peter Parker was, that he knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man. They had been longtime friends. And of course, we had previously seen this in the Marvel comics and Spider-Man's uh, publication history. And we learn that Ben Urich is going to be the one writing the expo on behalf of the Daily Bugle about Peter Parker and Spider-Man, but he wants to do it in a way to where he can make Peter Parker a great guy, but not betray the friendship that the two of them have. From there, we switch to Sally Floyd, and Sally Floyd is interviewing Firestar, and this, I think, is one of the coolest aspects of the comics because this, again, touches on the smaller characters. 
the smaller superheroes that don't have major roles, that don't have major publication histories or anything like that, and really kind of gives us this idea of how the civil uh, superhuman registration affects the small-time superheroes. And what we see is that Firestar is really not going to register, but she's not going to be a superhero either. She has a day job. She has, you know, responsibilities. And these really aren't things that she can sacrifice. She's putting herself through college and so on and so forth. If it became public that she was a superhero, that her public identity was revealed, she could lose her job and she could lose the ability to take care of herself. And this, I think, is one of the best parts of the Civil War story, because I think that, that a lot of the idea that people have when it comes to superheroes is that superheroes go out and fight crime and their needs are just kind of taken care of by some kind of mystical means. They somehow manage to get food or maybe somebody gives them food. People just give them money or something like that. But with this story, we see that they have jobs, that they have lives outside of being superheroes and that those lives allow them to continue their existence. They allow them to continue to live, allow them to further their careers because some, some of these people don't want to be superheroes for the long term. They want actual day jobs. They want a peaceful life and they don't want to fight crime forever. And so what we see is that Firestar actually abandons her role as a superhero and kind of returns to her normal life. From there, we jump to J. Jonah Jameson. And J. Jonah Jameson really kind of feels betrayed by Peter Parker. He employed Peter Parker. Peter Parker was a great employee for him. And the job of Peter Parker was to provide him with evidence that would incriminate Spider-Man. But because Peter Parker was Spider-Man, we had seen over the course of Peter Parker and Spider-Man's publication history that he had really kind of give him, uh, given him small bits, stuff that wouldn't really incriminate Peter Parker or Spider-Man or wouldn't even really lead to uh, the identity of Spider-Man as Peter Parker being revealed. J. Jonah Jameson feels betrayed by this. He feels like all this time he had been defrauded by Peter Parker, that Peter Parker had, had essentially been tricking him and making a fool out of him. We learn that he doesn't actually want to do an expose on Spider-Man anymore. He wants to abandon the entire idea of Spider-Man and focus on superheroes that are pro-registration and really kind of build them up. But we learn that uh, this really isn't going to work out, that the goal, the job of the Daily Bugle is to sell itself. And so if they go away, if they walk away from the hot topic at the moment, which is Spider-Man, they will lose money to other news outlets. From there, we jump to Prodigy. And Prodigy is a superhero who had been around for a while, but was really kind of a uh, smaller guy. Wasn't a great big, huge superhero on the level of Tony Stark or Captain America or anybody like that. And this part of the comic takes place one minute before the midnight deadline for superhuman registration. We see that Prodigy is on a rooftop drunk and is really kind of screaming at the crowd below, which consists of Ben Urich and Sally Floyd among a few members of the press and a multitude of citizens and is really just kind of ranting about how he believes that the superhuman registration is an erosion of individual freedoms and rights and he's really kind of trying to prove a point here. We see that Tony Stark and S.H.I.E.L.D. arrive and after a quick skirmish Tony Stark is successful in defeating Prodigy and takes him away. And this I think is very pivotal when it comes to the Civil War storyline because what we see here is really kind of a Marvel Comics allegory to real world events that are taking place here in the United States where people are sacrificing in their own individual freedom for a measure of personal security. And we see that Sally Floyd is really kind of providing this monologue as far as the events go regarding the uh, fight between Prodigy and Tony Stark and Prodigy's ranting and raving and so on. And one of the most important statements that is made is that the event, as far as this whole superhuman registration, was now beyond the control of normal humans. There was really nothing they could do to stop it. And even if they could, no one is questioning those in power. And the problem is that that nobody ever questions those in power until it's too late to question them. From there, we jump to Speedball, and Speedball is in a really, really bad situation. We really kind of pick up with him after he was arrested and uh, really kind of came to at the uh, end of Civil War Frontline issue number one, and we see that he's held at some undisclosed location, and he is presented with an ultimatum. Either he can, he can state that he was at fault, he can sign a form saying that he had screwed up and that they were the cause, the New Warriors were the cause for Nitro destroying a large portion of Stanford, in addition to joining the S.H.I.E.L.D anti-superhuman registration movement and uh, tracking down and arresting superheroes who refuse to register. We see that if he does not sign this, that he will be taken and he will be in imprisoned indefinitely with no kind of trial or anything like that. And again, this touches on the events that we've seen taking place in the United States where we saw uh, individuals being interred without uh, any real kind of trial and being interred indefinitely for various actions. 
In addition, we see that Robbie Baldwin refuses to sign the form, and he is taken to a prison where he is uh, released into general population. From there, he's ridiculed and abused by various prisoners who view him as a baby killer. From there, we jump to Norman Osborn, and Norman Osborn is really kind of revealed to be uh, a person watching Spider-Man reveal himself publicly, although we don't really know immediately that it is Norman Osborn. We see Norman Osborn really kind of fly into a fit of rage, claiming that Peter Parker broke the rules, and then we see that he is surrounded by two S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and they ask him if he's willing to play by a new set of rules which brings an end to Civil War Frontline issue number two.